Hello there, everybody. It is a pleasure to welcome you all here today at this artist talk recorded by VR uh, for the CAD Fair. Um, my name is Greg Ivazov, and I will be your host for the duration of the talk. Um, we hope you have been having a great experience at the fair so far, and that it will get even better as you learn more about digital art, meet more artists, and generally continue your path in this amazing and very welcoming community. Now, uh, before our wonderful panelists have a chance to introduce themselves, allow me to introduce the topic uh, of today's talk to you. Today we discuss the history of digital art and attempt to locate it in the broader world of art. Considering the latest developments in the sphere of digital art, not least its commercial expansion and the arrival of new forms of certification, it is easy to forget that this sphere has existed for quite some time now. Moreover, it may occasionally seem like digital art is something sort of separate from the rest of the art world, whereas fundamentally and culturally, it of course uh, has a plethora of ties to physical or corporeal art. Um, finally, digital art is a great example of what can be called an umbrella term, right? It describes a variety of genres, movements, uh, technologies, whether these really have anything more in common than the fact that a computer was somehow involved um, in their making is something that we will endeavor to discuss today. And hopefully this will prove informative for you at the fair. Overall, I hope I made it clear that I personally see this discussion as incredibly pertinent in today's context and hope that it will en enrich uh, the experience of any interested visitor um, by contextualizing the amazing diversity of art one is sure to encounter at Cardiff. So now without further ado, let us jump into um, questions and introductions. Um, Paul, do you mind briefly introducing yourself, please? Yes. Hi, I'm Paul Veller. I'm a curator and researcher. I am a lecturer at the Open University of Catalonia. And uh, in the last uh, 10 years, I have focused my research on the connections between uh, contemporary art, new media, and the art market. Particularly interested, and that was a subject of my PhD thesis, in how uh, the digital art has been introduced or is, is uh, getting introduced in the contemporary art world through the art market. Thanks very much, Pao. Um, and perhaps to get us started, um, one thing that makes digital art sort of different from um, physical is that um, its medium constantly evolves itself. Canvases and paints don't change nearly as much over time as computers and let's say artificial intelligence one can actually find at, at Cardiff. What, what impact do you think this has upon artists and artworks? Um, and is it fair at all to speak of digital as a medium in the same way that we speak uh, about oil and canvas as a medium, for example? Yeah, this has been one of the main criticisms against digital art, that it was mainly focused on the medium. And it has been, as you have also uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, the, this situation where uh, over the years it has uh, evolved uh, and is now we, we call digital art something that uh, describes a, a wide range of artistic practices. Some of them have nothing to do uh, among them, except for the fact that they're not painting or sculpture. You know? I, I believe that uh, in, in much of the way that digital art has been defined is that it is not like the other contemporary art that we used to see in museums and galleries. You know? uh, but it is true also that uh, this introduction of new technologies have brought new ways of creating art and new ways of experiencing it. Now, what is interesting to me is that uh, artists are always there, always ready to start looking for creative ways of using these new technologies as they come up. So what usually happens is that we have first an uh, initial phase where there is kind of um, like a situation where uh, there is a lot of passion for the technology itself, for what it can do. It's, it's kind of a discovery phase where you might find artworks that are exploring this technology and finding out what they can do with them but sometimes from the point of view of an art historian or someone from the contemporary art community, we might think they lack uh, content. We are looking for some kind of concept that is behind that. We sometimes don't find it because the artists are 
uh, starting to uh, uh, explore that technology. And later on, as the technology itself becomes, as Clay Shirko would put it, it becomes boring, uh, then it becomes conceptually interesting because it's, it's then entwined, in, in, uh, inserted into society, it has new uses. And then is when we can start uh, you know, playing with it conceptually and adding new uh, subjects to it and, and new ways of, of looking at it. You know? So we are going always through these different, different phases. It has happened with interactive art. It happened before with computer art, uh, um, artificial intelligence, net art, all of these. Uh, um, they, we always have been going through these different phases where first there is this kind of uh, uh, yeah, this kind of enthusiasm over the technology itself. And then there is kind of a maturation where you can go a bit deeper into the content. Right. Thanks very much, Paul. All very valuable points. We'll make sure to come back to them later on throughout the talk. Uh, but for now, I see that Yelena has joined us too. Um, Yelena, I, I'm sure you don't need an introduction for for the the viewers at Cardiff TV, but for the sake of formality, uh, could you please say a few words about yourself? Oh, thank you so much. Very kind of you. Uh, yes, my name is Elena. I'm the founder of Cardiff, uh, and it's the third, uh, the third, the fourth edition of Cardiff that we're hosting. Uh, this time around, we had two in-person editions when we didn't know that we had to have virtual editions. So we had one in New York, then the next one in uh, Miami. And um, then we had the first virtual edition last June, and now it's the fourth one. So we're super excited about that and are planning new editions as we speak. We also founded Digital Art Month, which is an augmented reality festival that is taking place actually uh, Right now in Paris, it's the third edition of the festival already. Within the short period of time, we hosted one in New York, one in Miami, and uh, now one in Paris. And now we're working on the next edition in uh, October in New York. Thanks very much, Elena. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, so to get us started, um, Let's imagine um, a collector browsing through the pages of Cadoff Online, who's interested in digital art and marveling at the cornucopia of genres. There's generative VR, AI, etc. And so, and and wondering where it all came from. So, what would you say to such a collector? What are some fundamental things one ought to know about the origins of digital art if one is interested in sort of uh, collecting it, uh, and how did it explore into this variety of genres? Uh, if the question is the question to me, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a long story. Digital art has been up for a while, uh, but things has, have been changing. This year has been uh, quite nice for digital art with the attention uh, to uh, its particular varieties, such as uh, blockchain-based art, so to say. But even that is not a proper thing to say because blockchain is just pretty much recording the provenance of very few artists that I know are actually experimenting with blockchain uh, as a medium. One of the one that I know uh, pretty well uh, is Kevin Abosh, who is working conceptually with blockchain for a while. Uh, you probably remember his piece, I'm a Coin, um, where when he tokenized his blood and uh, trying to play with the code uh, to kind of bring the medium uh, into, into the conversation rather than just uh, uh, speaking about more recording the provenance. But then, so at Kadaf, we are trying the, the original goal. It all started actually uh, after we hosted a number of conferences, art and tech conferences. Um, we started in 2017. And at the time, if you remember in 2017, blockchain came to everybody's attention. So it was a, you know, a lot of attention to Bitcoin, um, all that things. And then we noticed that actually art startups are starting to um, look at, into blockchain as well. And you might remember again, the startup called Masinas, for example, that tried to tokenize uh, artworks uh, at a scale. Um, so we invited uh, a lot of them to speak at our events. 
Macinus was actually one of the, or the first one. Uh, yeah, I think our first event had uh, Macinus at that time. Uh, and we had even, you know, at the time, artsy C CTO, Daniel Dubrovkin, when artsy started looking into blockchain, uh, they haven't actually made um, a lot of progress there yet, but I think, uh, you know, things might change in the future. But anyway, so we saw uh, this community building up with the artists, uh, um, developers becoming artists, uh, galleries starting to pay, uh, to pay a lot of attention to digital art collectors, you know, with all the crypto kitty sales and other fun stuff, uh, and more traditional digital art collectors as well as I also have more traditional art backgrounds. So I've been working at the auction house and for different e-commerce platforms uh, within the art market for a while. So I had this great community uh, in front of us, uh, which was the combination of the tech crowd and the art crowd. And then we were sitting there with Andrea Steuer, who is the director and CCO of Kadefin. Uh, she's like, well, but there is no art fair that's dedicated to digital art that exists at that point. And there were a few tries uh, or long-term tries, but uh, probably the time was a little bit too early. And also all of them focused uh, as far as I know on very limited number of mediums. So then we decided, why don't we come up with one? And then the idea was to show the, really the diversity of the mediums in digital art. There is so much stuff that's going on every day. There is a new medium, you know? Yesterday was virtual reality uh, that was so popular and unusual. Today, more augmented reality, more 3D modeling in between, uh, you know, everything. So our goal from the beginning was to show the diversity. We really didn't want to focus just on video, just on blockchain, just on crypto art, whatever. We really wanted to show the diversity so that the collector, when he come, or she comes to the fair, they really see, um, you know, the, the spread of the mediums that exist. And also so that uh, they see the, the way that the artist intended the work to be. So for the video art, for example, or for any other kind of digital art, uh, so to say, uh, you know, we always see it on the screen of the computer or on the screen of the phone, which is really not the ideal place to see any art at all, including or maybe even especially uh, digital art. So we wanted really to show that scale. And when we had events um, in New York and in Miami, we really had one of the big, um, you know, efforts that we were trying to make is to really have big projections, uh, immersive uh, rooms where people could really understand how this video can, or image or 3D uh, piece can, can behave when it's really uh, large. But then also on the um, like TV screen so that uh, they also can understand how it would look at their homes. So there were a lot of uh, things like that that we were thinking of. And I think uh, uh, it kind of worked out because um, I think for the artists and for the goers, it's really important to show uh, digital art as it was intended. Now for the virtual editions, our idea was to recreate art fair bus in the virtual environment. And then that was the main goal because, you know, when we first started last June, we were all in quarantine sitting, well, still a little bit, I'm sitting in my living room right now. Um, but we wanted to really show, um, you know, the visitors. So for example, one of the things that we wanted a uh, uh, viewer to see is how many visitors are currently in a booth or at the fair. Um, we wanted people to chat. So we wanted really them to interact with one another. We also wanted to include our cultural programming. So we really, you know, believe from our conferences day that, you know, introducing the uh, collector to the medium and to the, um, to the artists and to the galleries is extremely important. So we uh, recorded more than 40 hours of talks, I think, uh, last June, and we'll have a lot of uh, many, many hours uh, this time around as well. I, my, I have to double check how many exactly, but I will be quite a lot. And so each gallery or artist has a booth. They can show different kinds of mediums, of course, as well. There is also a community uh, aspect that's super important for us. So we have a lot of community efforts to try to bring everyone together, to speak to each other, to network. And so, yes, 
I guess I, I hope I answered some of you. Yes, of course, of course. Of course, I, I was just uh, wanted to elaborate very quickly upon one point that you mentioned. So one thing that makes digital art exciting, and I quite agree here with you, is the fact that it constantly changes. There's constantly new genres, new movements. Uh, it's very dynamic. It's probably one of the, the more dynamic space in the whole art world. But I wager that that's uh, also an aspect that perhaps make it, uh, can make it a little bit more difficult to collect digital art or at least inspire some worry in a prospective collector. So in your experience as the head of the fair and maybe the leader in the broader art market as well, are collectors of digital art guided by the same things that their counterparts are in the physical realm? Um, should they be guided by the same things or is this sort of um, volatility or dynam dynamicism um, sort of creating different principles for, for, for prospective collectors? I feel it's a little bit different, to be honest. I think that uh, a lot of uh, things that drive collecting in the digital art space today is community. So I see a lot of collectors who are also artists uh, or who are art industry, digital art industry professionals and so on. And so they enjoy learning about all these new genres. They enjoy learning about the artists. They communicate with each other all the time on Twitter, Discord. Uh, and uh, that drives a lot of purchasing behavior. For the traditional art market to step in more, uh, I guess the situation uh, still needs to develop a little bit. We are very early on. Although, you know, the big auction houses already have pretty good sales for uh, digital art, even though most of it is NFT and maybe a little bit of hype. Uh, but uh, I think that this situation is still very important and uh, hopefully we will have, and I see already there are quite a few curated sales that take place at the major auction houses, which I really like and curated by the community leaders, by curators. We'd love to cu curate a sale uh, at the auction house uh, um, because I think it's it's really important to bring uh, again the diversity of the mediums in digital art to the general public and uh, for the sale ideally not just to be driven by hype but by the attention to the art because what's the most important thing about uh, you know digital art market, any art market's art, it's the artist. And with the digital art, it's super unique because pretty much everyone, almost everyone, uh, with a few exceptions, are living artists and they uh, create their work today and their work, uh, you know, yesterday is different from what they're doing today or that they will be doing tomorrow. It's extremely interesting. Uh, I think the potential is huge. So I think it's just the matter of bringing it more to the uh, general public. Thanks very much, Elena. Wow. I wonder if we can pick up on some of the themes that have been touched upon with Yelena and discuss what makes digital art so special. So um, aside from fulfilling the role of a virtual can canvas, um, mm -hmm. digital also acts as a host for the internet. Uh, and so the host for an astounding amount of culture, information, communities, and discord, just to name a few things. So it really is much broader and more multifaceted than a physical medium, uh, something that we have already touched upon with you. So mm -hmm. is it then useful to speak of digital art at all beyond uh, uh, just art created with the help of a computer? Is, is there sort of uh, anything more that links it together, its subgenres together beyond considering um, the, 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 the means of creation itself? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I would point out then to uh, something that is already also a classical distinction that was suggested by Steve Dietz, which are the behaviors of digital art. So the fact that uh, digital artwork is based on a, on a process that is computable, that is interactive, or that it is connected. So these kind of behaviors, the fact, and particularly the fact that an, a digital artwork is based on a process, makes it different from other artworks. I mean, usually when you see a painting or a video or a sculpture, it's a finished artwork. It is done. The, the artist did this thing and it is done. But then when you have a digital artwork, in most cases, you can have an artwork based on a process. So the artwork will evolve. It will do things. And that I think it's a very uh, exciting prospect for a collector 
to have an artwork that can evolve, that can take data from the internet, that can change over time, uh, that can also uh, bring in a, a, a different way of owning, of ownership, you know. And, uh, and that is uh, something that also, as a collector, one has to understand that you have to take care of this artwork, that it's not just a, an, an object that will be there and won't change, but that it's, since it's based on a, pro a process, since it has a software, you have to take care of it. You know? For instance, uh, artist Rafael Lozano Hemer once said, you have to treat the artwork like a car. You have the car, maybe it's in your garage, it's a beautiful car, but sometimes, you know, you have to put the engine on, you have to move it around, you have to take care of it. Maybe at some point you'll, you'll need to replace some parts, no problem, but you have to think about the artwork in this, in this manner. I think that some uh, collectors have been a bit afraid of this aspect. Uh, and, and what I would say to those collectors is, is, you know, don't be afraid. There is much more that you can find in digital art that can be really exciting, that can be very special. Uh, but then in that sense, I suggest in, in my book about collecting, I suggest this uh, uh, figure of the geek collector. So a geek collector is simply someone who has uh, some interest in technology. You don't have to be a programmer, you don't have to be an expert, but simply someone who, you know, you don't mind, you know, configuring your Wi-Fi, you don't mind entering your computer and fixing a few things, you know. Uh, you know how to run a, com a program on a computer, so you will take care of your artwork, which might be, for instance, an, an interactive piece or a net-based piece that you have to turn it on, that you have to to take care of the software, this kind of things, you know. So I think that is that is a, a way in which you can get more involved with the art because it's not something that will just stay there and not change, but it's something that will depend on you. It's a bit like having a plant too, you know, you have to water it sometime, you have to take care of it, but that makes you also more conscious that you own that plant, that you own that artwork, you know, and that you care for it. And I think that is really worth it. Absolutely, absolutely. It's almost a developing a relationship with, which I guess all great collectors will tell you that they do with their art. So if we speak a little bit more hands-on about what it's like to sort of deal and own um, and be with digital art, I wonder if we can speak a little bit more about exhibiting. So how art is shown has always been a crucial feature of the way it is experienced. Um, counter to what many assume today, the primary way to exhibit digital art historically has been physically in a gallery. Obviously, virtual exhibitions came somewhat later. Um, so I wonder, uh, Pao, if you can speak uh, to our audience a little bit about the history of exhibiting digital art and sort of what impact the way digital is presented uh, has upon the overall experience of, of its visitors. So um, in this sense, I think uh, that uh, when we think about why digital art has not been more integrated in the contemporary art world, um, we usually uh, look at the technical aspects, you know, on, on, on how it is preserved or, or, or et cetera. But I think it's more of a contextual situation that all this art came out from new media art festivals, from uh, different uh, spaces that were not uh, the usual spaces of uh, contemporary art, you know, the museums, the, the biennials, the big galleries, you know. Although there was a, a moment where there, there was uh, artists showing in museums and participating in large exhibitions, uh, I think most of the, mm, the new media art community went to these specific festivals and then they created a whole other sphere you know, which kind of made it separate from the, from the contemporary art world. Now we are seeing how this comes back. Uh, and uh, this is also crucial. The way it has come back uh, uh, in most cases has been with artists adapting their work to the conditions of the gallery. You know, particularly if, you, if we look at post-internet artists who consider that to talk about the internet, you don't have to put your work online anymore, but that uh, the internet is everywhere. So they have shown their works as prints, as sculptures. So back to the physical form that we know that that is more accepted in the contemporary art world, which is fine because it, it's also part of an, of an evolution, you know? 
but I think that makes it that the way most of the uh, people who are in the contemporary art world still haven't seen all of the different ways in which uh, digital art or new media art, whatever you want to call it, can develop. You know, they might have seen like a tiny fraction, which is mostly what you see in the art market, which, uh, as I say, has been the place of uh, in which uh, digital art has entered the contemporary art world mostly. And when you enter through the market, you enter in very specific formats, which tend to be video, screen-based, uh, and then objects or prints, yeah. you know. Uh, so that has also affected the way people understand uh, digital art, which can be, as I said, more varied and even more wild than we uh, most people think it can be. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, and this connection between the broader, let's say, contemporary art world and the digital in specific is a topic that I was hoping to address a little bit more uh, throughout this talk. So in, in the spirit of understanding this interconnection, uh, Paul, Paul, to what extent can we sort of talk about the artist communities of the broader contemporary art world and the digital one talking to each other? To what extent have uh, digital movements impacted physical ones and vice versa? I realize that the pro probably the taxonomy between digital and physical is less clear than many would suspect it is, uh, as based on as based on your responses. But but if you can um, try to translate it to uh, lay terms, that would that would be great. Hmm. Uh, so. Uh, what you're asking is how there has been uh, like an interaction between yes, yes. cultural and interaction between contemporary between. art. Yes. Well, I think that, uh, well, one of the things that has happened is that uh, in the contemporary art world, there has been a growing awareness that we live in a, in a digital world, that we live in a society mediated by technology. But then what has happened, and there has been several examples of this, when they look at a concept like interactivity or the internet or so, they look at the artists they know, which are artists, uh, have been mostly artists that did not work with technology. So they might approach something like uh, a search engine through a collection of printed images or through a collection of, uh, you know, objects or whatever, which, which is fine. But then what has happened is that in the artist community, in the new media artist community, they have felt uh, that they, they were not seen, you know, because they were addressing those same uh, subjects with the technology that makes those subjects, but they were totally invisible to this uh, contemporary art uh, field. And this is what uh, the, the curator, Christian Paul, uh, once described as uh, the relational aesthetic syndromes. So she referred to this uh, famous uh, text by Nicolas Bourriot from the late 90s, uh, Relational Aesthetics, which also made all these references to the fact that we live in a society of uh, screens, of uh, interactivity. But then uh, the, the, the examples he found was, were artists who were working, obviously, in the contemporary art field, and, and, and their idea of dealing with interactivity was participation, was allowing people to uh, like take a candy, like in famous uh, installation by Felix Gonzalez Torres, or uh, drink uh, some soup or th this kind of thing, while there were artists working with interactive systems, with technology, with computer vision, that they were actually putting into practice this concept of interactivity, but they were not seen. So this has been also quite of a constant uh, and many artists have kind of fought to uh, find their way uh, into uh, the contemporary art world. And you have many uh, books written on the subject, like there was this monograph by Edward Schanken uh, published by Feiden some years ago, where he did all this uh, effort to bring in all this uh, new media art world into the, um, the historic, uh, trends of uh, contemporary art so as to integrate it and to show this is part of, of the same roots, you know, but developed with different, with different means. And you have also shows like uh, Electronic Superhighway, curated by Omar Khalif in uh, the Whitechapel Gallery in London a few years ago, or a program um, curated uh, by Christian Paul 
who uh, uh, all this in all these shows, what they were doing was making these connections between contemporary art and a digital art and showing all this historic legacy and all this this lines of connection. So one of the main things also is to, to on, on the one hand, to show people that digital art is contemporary art. And on the other hand, that digital art is not just something new that some kids just made or some nerds just created. It's something that has a long history and it's deeply rooted in the same roots of contemporary art. Thanks very much, Pa. Uh, I'm sure a prospective collector will be much more informed than just a visitor too. Hello, Greg. Uh, very glad to be, to be um, uh, presenting and talking in this uh, discussion that uh, touched to very sensible, sensitive uh, topics. Uh, so I'm Maurice Benayoun. I'm a media artist. Uh, I started working with uh, electronic media in the early 80s and with digital media in the middle of the 80s. Thanks very much, Morris. It's a pleasure to have you with us at the panel. Um, so to get us started uh, talking about sort of digital art history and where uh, an interested collector might place it, I um, want to sort of ask you about um, digital art and what it really is, how it emerged and what its sort of defining feature uh, features are. So to continue down this path, I would like to discuss and integral feature of a lot of digital art, which is time. Um, like no other medium, uh, digital enables the artist to really use time to sort of express. Uh, so do you see this as a defining feature of the variety of artworks that are collectively known as digital art? And if so, um, could you please help us broadly contextualize time-based media and, and their impact? Uh, I would say that time-based media started probably with cinema in the 19th century. And so I would say that the main component and the main rupture, uh, disruption with pre-existing practices uh, is more virtuality. It's the fact to introduce virtuality into art. And this was made possible only thanks to the uh, digital tools. So virtuality, what it is, is the fact that uh, the world uh, cannot be totally defined in terms of future because we don't know how it will evolve. And so what happens if we remove virtuality from the world? The world stays stuck before the Big Bang. And it's embarrassing because we wouldn't be talking to each other now. And so if we introduce virtuality in the world, we get the world as it is. Uh, which is made of virtuality. But uh, artworks used to be objects, you know, they used to be painting, they used to be sculptures, things that has been defined forever as a combination of components, uh, at the same time, materiality and meaning. But this, of course, has been changed when uh, the art artworks have become a subject. When artworks start to have a behavior, when artworks start to evolve in time, when artworks start to be receptive to the environment and perceive uh, the people and their public. And so when, when artworks started to have their own life affected by either artificial intelligence or artificial intentionality, uh, then we are talking about something totally different because the artist is not anymore uh, doing something which is the best composition forever, the best combination combination of content and elements forever. It is the best composition of dynamic elements that could and should make sense out of what will happen around them. And so that's the main rupture that we discovered with VR, with generative art and so on. Another aspect which is very important, and I think it's very close to what interests you, is uh, uh, what, what may be the difference of having a kind of dematerialized uh, practices where suddenly uh, the value of the artwork become totally detached from the object itself, which is normally what happens when uh, you uh, go that way or down that way or up that way. Uh, and this is something 
uh, that you may understand if you know a little bit about conceptual art. So you, you, have, you have artists like Duchamp who started with, a, with uh, he's not the one who conceived uh, the fountain, but starting considering that you can separate the artist's gesture, intention to the artist making something. And this separation is of course a big difference because suddenly the artist is not the one who is the only one to give a specific shape is the one just showing the thing and saying, this is art. And because of that, uh, it changed many things. Then in the middle of the 20th century, people starting to do what we call conceptual art. And conceptual art is, for example, giving a definition and say, that's it. Now you can make it if you want or not, but you own it because you paid for it. <laughs> So artists like Sol Lewitt uh, started making artwork where there were just a few lines saying where well, you should make a rectangle and a circle, put them together on a wall and choose a color that way and you make your artwork. Selling that. Some other just uh, whisper to your ear a definition of the artwork and you pay for that. Because suddenly the materiality of the artwork has become dissolved in this in its virtuality. And this is a big change of digital art. I've thanks done my five minutes, I guess. No, no, thanks very much, Maurice. Um, to continue uh, down this lane, um, you've already mentioned conceptual art. Uh, so to continue down this lane, I wonder if, Maurice, you can help us trace the connection of digital art to the wider art world. So it's clear that um, the it's clear that um, in order to understand digital art, you really need to have a good understanding of art history as a whole. In that sense, it's an integral part of it and not some disconnected uh, aspect of it. So if we can briefly go back a century, well, Maurice, you already took us. Uh, broadly, one of the stories of 20th century is art sort of stripping down in an attempt to answer the question, what is art? That's sort of the relation to the sort of enhanced power of the artist that you mentioned, who gets to label what is and what is not. Uh, so this process of simplification, to put it very crudely, led us from uh, representational, let's say, neoclassical paintings of the uh, of the late 19th century to cubists and maybe complete abstractionists, and finally to conceptual art. Um, one facet of conceptual art can be uh, described as instruction art. So at some point during the 20th century, all that artists left to uh, viewers uh, are, were instructions, right? Uh, just strings of text of what to do in order to recreate their experience. Um, funny enough, uh, these strings of text also became the first inputs for digital art, right? Uh, the first strings of code that resulted in the first digital artworks, let's say maybe in the, in the 60s. So th the reason I share this anecdote is to illustrate that digital art has many connections to the physical art um, realm. And so if I can anecdotally ask you to share any other connections that sort of spring to mind uh, that you care to share with our audience uh, between the sort of what we see today as the digital art realm and the physical art realm uh, that can prove really uh, instructive for, uh, for, for those interested in the topic, but not perhaps um, aware of the full context yet. Okay. It's very difficult to consider that there is a category of art in terms of representation or in terms of production that would be defined by the fact that we use the digital medium uh, to produce it. Uh, what is not digital now is like if I would be talking about electric art. And as soon as you turn on the light in a museum, every artwork becomes electric art. And so what? Yeah, you cannot say that you make, you're making crypto art because you sell your art online. It's not enough. So it's more about what is exactly the medium doing that will modify the definition of art. To understand that, you have to go back to Leonardo. Leonardo said, Leonardo said, art e cosa mentale. He said, la pittura e cosa mentale. That is something coming from the mind. 
And this is, of course, what we try to do with value of values, which is, you know, this series of artworks where we use uh, electroencephalography, EEG, uh, in order to give shape to abstractions, give shape to concept, give shape to values. What is the shape of love, of peace, of money, of uh, uh, whatever like that, of compassion? What is the shape? Shape of space. What is the shape of space? And this is something that artists have been wondering for the last millennia. And as soon as you understand that, you understand, of course, that the digital medium is probably the more convenient to do that. And now artists may use this possibility of giving shape to abstractions, giving shape to things that you cannot see. So it's not reproducing the real as it reflects the light. Uh, as soon as you can do that, uh, there are many things that happen. And you understand that what you do may infiltrate the society. Art is not anymore on a white wall. Art is not anymore something that you can see the surface and tell the price. Check the weight and tell the price. No. <laughs> Art is something which is a process. This process can affect different fields of society. And this is why uh, sometimes dealing with cryptocurrencies and NFTs and so on may be dealing with finance, dealing with value. What is the value? What is the value of the values? What is the value of art? Is it just the amount of money you can deal? You can see now, it's a joke. Prices depends only on speculation. They are not determined by what people believe in. They are determined by how they consider they will make more money later using the same, following the same process. While at the same time, it would be possible to take this medium, take this potential of affecting finance, of playing with certain rules of society and giving the power to the artist to uh, understand better the world. So if art is about representing the world in a way, it's not anymore about representing the light reflecting by objects like a still life it may be activating processes that make the world more understandable. And this is what I try to do with value of values, to understand better what the values are for people and how we understand the hierarchy, the ranking of values for society. And so this is a totally different issue. It's not a virtual white cube. It's not a, a virtual art gallery or whatever. We have to fight for that. We really have to fight for that. We have to fight for a real appropriation by the artist of the world at every level. And the infiltration of this world by artworks and artists is probably gonna change the scene and not only the prices. Thanks very much, Maurice. Um, nothing really to add, incredibly eloquent. Thanks very much for joining us here. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be here today on this panel and I'm Anastasia Gribova, uh, the stock for the CADAF online and we are also honored to participate uh, uh, in the digital art fair with our project, Art Spaceship, which unites uh, 21 artworks from 24 artists all over the world. And I have a legal and economic background initially, so I came to art naturally. Uh, after years of practice, both as a project manager and also a head of legals and also head of financial part for many projects. Some of them were actually dealing with digital art and virtual art to be precise. So seeing what's going on in the sphere, uh, me and my colleagues launched the VR uh, and I hope that uh, we are kind of living through the era when the digital art becomes, um, if I may say so, the new contemporary. Thanks very much, Anastasia. It's a big pleasure to have you with us. Um, and sort of to touch upon the topic of digital from a more applied angle. 
As we have seen throughout this talk, um, digital art can be quite confusing and sort of less accessible than one might wish for um, an interested party. So how would you recommend uh, that one goes about familiarizing oneself with digital art as a collector? What are some examples of good first steps for an interested collector? Thank you, Greg. That's a good and a bit tricky question because uh, I personally tend to uh, kind of differentiate between the art lovers and art buyers, and of course with the collectors, because the collector is always a person who cares about the collection, so uh, who does uh, the promotion of it, who cares about the future of the artwork and of course, of course, of the career of the artist, if that's an artist who lives at the same time. Uh, so, in my personal point of view, there is no right way to familiarize with digital art. And I have also experienced many times when people started uh, looking at the digital art and the first artwork which they have seen, for instance, uh, on the head uh, of the virtual art website, uh, was a bit so. Uh, not of their personal choice and afterwards they thought that oh digital art is not for me so what i like about digital arts most is of course the uh, variety of genres which are already there variety of uh, mediums also inside of this you know, medium of digital uh so everybody can find something for themselves so my first advice is of course not to stop at one uh, artwork even if in case you, you, if you do not like it so give a try to other platforms give a try to other artists and uh i'm totally sure that you will find something which is uh, exactly what you would like uh second uh, advice is of course to look at the background of the artist uh and look at the as a story behind each artwork, because as in concept art, as same goes for traditional or physical, uh, sometimes this text part or the concept behind the artwork is the most important one, so it's so for you to understand what is going on there. Uh, even though 2021 for me uh, personally is uh, relatively an era where when gifts, gifts are becoming the leading way of presenting digital art and so many artworks are uh, completely clear in terms of the idea behind. I totally feel that it's important to educate yourself on the senses, on the senses which are behind and of course on the cultural uh, value of the artworks which you are looking at. So we at We Art are uh, trying to uh, demystify uh, the topic of uh, the value of art and of course to unite the cultural and commercial value of each artwork so if you are looking uh, forward to buying a digital artwork make sure that you have familiarized yourself enough with the concept behind with the artists and of course check the intellectual property part uh, because unfortunately now uh, now with uh, with the rise of the nft uh, some digital platforms become a uh, really wild wild west and that's totally normal when the market is so disruptively growing especially if the platforms are non-curated so uh, so the artist is free to load any digital file uh, so see uh, the background of the artwork and of course look at the provenance uh, so as to make sure that uh, you are buying a unique artwork and uh, that the artist is actually the author and uh, it's not a scam which was uploaded there. Right. Uh, thanks very much. I feel like this is very instructive for, for a prospective collector. Um, one worry that perhaps uh, such a collector might also need uh, addressing is the sort of perception of uh, volatility across the um, across the digital art market. One thing that may put somebody off is the fact that because this is perceived as something very new, um, the value may fluctuate and um, trends might change uh, a little bit quicker than one might have imagined. And um, once new possessions uh, may be out of vogue simply very uh, quickly. And so um, what do you say to such, uh, to such a collector? How does one uh, sort of really try to make some sound purchasing decisions in this sphere? I know you've already mentioned looking at the provenance and learning more about the field as a whole. Do you have anything to add? Hmm. Uh, of course, I totally understand the collectors, which are newcomers to the digital art market, and they see that one quarter of the market goes to one artist, namely to the people. Uh, so you feel that uh, the market can be overhyped, 
or maybe too new for you even to try. But what I usually say, uh, because when we started at VRD, um, I was actually explaining to, uh, to the audience what digital art actually is and conducted many uh, deep interviews with the collectors of the physical art and they were asking me, like, why do I have to buy a digital, digital file? What can I do with it? Uh, and the main argument here is that digital art is here already, already for a long, long period of time. So Andy Warhol was doing digital art. And uh, in the way, even uh, how we perceive digital art now, it's already there for almost 70 years. So that's not something which was created in 2017 or 2018 with the beginning of the crypto art part. It's just a new lap uh, of a new leap of what's going on on the market. And uh, I would recommend to also look at the history of the development of uh, this movement and perceive digital art as just a new way of expression. So we live in digital era, we have digital art. Same happened to electronic music or to electronic books. So we no longer feel that music has to be on, on the CDs. So the same happens to art. And regarding the volatility, um, I can understand why people do not uh, see, uh, do not uh, believe in kind of the price range or the commercial value of the art, which was uh, sold without any previous background, or the artist is fully anonymous and the artwork was resold within a minute or within an hour, and then you actually have no idea of the provenance, whether it's legitimate or was it created artificially. So. Uh, in that case, I would also recommend to look, as I've said, at the artists, to look at the background and at the provenance, and also work with the platforms which already gain some trust in the market. Uh, what can help here is, of course, electronic certification, because with, with each artwork goes a register, and it's uh, an additional protection uh, to the blockchain part where every transaction is recorded that you can also um, be sure that what you are receiving, what, what the file which you are buying or non-fungible token which you are buying is valid. Um, and uh, to finish off this, this, this mini interview, um, Anastasia, what attracts you to the field of digital art? Oh, that's, uh, I, can, I can so vividly remember the first time when I have encountered digital art. Uh, it was the exhibition of the artworks by William Kendridge. Uh, it was actually a big, uh, big uh, solo show. It was in Salzburg in Austria, uh, in the Museum of Contemporary Arts there. And I was so mesmerized by, by the colors, by this feeling when you are in a completely dark room and then the digital art emerges around you. It's on the screens, it's projected uh, with various, various types of lighting and projectors. And so uh, compared to my actually big background of visiting the physical art museums all over the world, um, it was something so new and something so refreshing. Uh, and uh, as I have already said, with digital era comes digital art. Uh, so I feel, uh, I feel the same about, uh, about the art too. And one of the collectors, which we uh, had also an interview with, uh, said that, uh, and I totally agree with this phrase that nowadays art institutions are also competing with the entertainment segment. So art uh, kind of corresponds to, to the modern audience that it has to be more engaging and more immersive. Uh, so that what's, that's why I'm so fascinated by digital art that it can give you uh, a way more interesting experience and it helps you also to understand yourself better than uh, any other type of uh, interacting with art so for me personally no offense if you were into classical music instead of digital art thanks very much uh, as 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 one can see throughout the works at cardiff perhaps and definitely at Viert, the two can actually interact but regardless thanks very much anastasia and thanks very much everybody this concludes this brief um talk and the overview of the history of digital art its context and the evolution it has been amazing to talk with all of our panelists experts and entrepreneurs um and we hope that this will enrich the experience of those visiting the fair and and deepen the understanding of the amazing art uh, that one can find at the fair. All that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening in and that you can always look at these works in greater detail uh, throughout the booths at the fair. Um, we hope to see you out there uh, on the pages of Cataf Online. Uh, thank you very much.